A reading from the Acts of the Apostles. There broke out a severe persecution of the church in Jerusalem, and all were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. <coughs> Devout men buried Stephen and made a loud lament over him. Saul, meanwhile, was trying to destroy the church. Entering house after house and dragging out men and women, he handed them over for imprisonment. Now those who had been scattered went about preaching the word. Thus Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Christ to them. With one accord, the crowds paid attention to what was said by Philip when they heard it and saw the signs he was doing. For unclean spirits crying out in a loud voice came out of many possessed people, and many paralyzed and crippled people were cured. There was great joy in that city. Let all the earth cry out to God with joy. Shout joyfully to God, all the earth. Sing praise to the glory of his name. Proclaim his glorious praise. Say to God, how tremendous are your deeds. Let all the earth worship and sing praise to you. Sing praise to your name. Come and see the works of God, his tremendous deeds among the children of Adam. He has changed the sea into dry land. Through the river they pass on foot. Therefore let us rejoice in him. He rules by his might forever. Dominus Fabiscum, Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum, Ioannum, Jesus said it to his disciples, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. But I told you that although you have seen me, you do not believe. Everything that the Father gives me will come to me, and I will not reject anyone who comes to me. Because I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of the one who sent me. And this is the will of the one who sent me, that I should not lose anything of what he gave me, but that I should raise it up on the last day. For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have eternal life. And I shall raise him up on the last day. Verbum do homine.
This past Monday, a number of the friars and EWTN employees went to help those who suffer from the devastating tornadoes just west of town in Pleasant Grove was one of the areas that was especially hit by this massive tornado. And what was once a beautiful lush area with uh, beautiful large trees now looks like a desert. And the family of the home that we helped, we had the opportunity to meet the mother who fortunately is able to stay with her daughter now, who told me that she had been in this home for 46 years. She's 78 years old, her husband is 80. Their granddaughter who was living with them said, you better get into the basement. It was then she said, I heard a sound I never want to hear again. And fortunately, their basement was preserved, but their house was completely lost. And while Jeff Han and I had gone to get some supplies, some work gloves and other things, it was there at the store that a man came up to us knowing that we were with the Catholic Church and involved in helping with the recovery efforts, asking what sort of things were available. And then he went on to say that his own daughter had come to visit in Tuscaloosa and he hasn't heard from her for 10 days. And he began to weep. He said, I know that she must be gone because he hadn't heard from her. And so we think of all of this tragedy and all of this heartache that uh, we experience, and not only here and many other places throughout the world, these tragic events. And yet, I couldn't help but notice, as we were there, working signs of the resurrection, signs of the risen Christ, signs of his life and his love. Two of the employees who had come said, we just felt like we wanted to do something. We wanted to help out. While the friars were there working and helping with the cleanup, three times people drove by and said, you need food, you need water. And there were many churches that had set up places where they could get food or water or clothing and people involved in helping. It's something that makes you understand that this is not merely survival of the fittest that's going on here, but there's something much greater, something beautiful that can spring out of this tragedy is this fraternal love, this unity that uh, we experience in helping those in need. And so we heard in today's first reading from the Acts of the Apostles how this was a time of tragedy for the church because we read that St. Luke wrote, a severe persecution broke out. He uses the word severe. Severe persecution broke out. And one of those who was most severe in his persecution was Saul, who we are told went house to house. He entered house to house. He dragged off men and women and hauled them into prison. He wanted to destroy the church. That's what we heard this morning. So this persecution is going on, and the Christians are being scattered all over the place. And yet something remarkable was said as well, that even while they were scattered, they continued to proclaim the word of God. You see, when this trial had happened for the church and for the early church, they didn't just come to the conclusion, okay, all is lost, all is ruined, let's just give up. No, they knew that the risen Lord was with them even in this, even in this being scattered. And help me uh, reminded me also of an event in the life of St. Maximilian Mary Colby. And you may not know that he actually went to the concentration camp twice. And the first time at the end of their captivity, they had prayed a novena to Our Lady. And it was on December 8th that they were actually released the first time. The second time, he knew that he was going to be in danger of being taken again, but he said the, sh the shepherd can't abandon the sheep. And so he remained there and was taken for the second time where he ended his life giving his life for another man.
But the event that I remembered was when he and other friars were being taken this first time to the concentration camp and they were being loaded onto this train and all of the hardships that were part of that. And as they were going along, Maximilian said, well, we should be grateful. And somebody said, grateful? Grateful why? He said, because we're getting free transportation where we can bring the gospel to another area. You know, it's kind of a little humor even in the midst of that trouble, but also there was a sincerity in what he was saying. Okay, we're going to go to someplace else, but we can bring the gospel there too. And that's what the early Christians had in their own minds, that here we're being scattered, there's a severe persecution going on in Jerusalem. Well, this gives us the opportunity now to bring the gospel to others. And so we read about the deacon Philip. He was the second one mentioned of those seven deacons. He wasn't the apostle Philip, but the deacon Philip, who was working signs and wonders among the people, continued to proclaim the gospel and, and so on. These signs of the resurrection were continuing even in the midst of this hardship and of this tragedy. And so you see it, it isn't, doesn't really matter, it's not really important how long we live. We don't know how many days we have. But what matters is not how long we live, but rather how we live and how we die. So yesterday we heard in the Acts of the Apostles of Stephen's death and how many similarities there were with the way that Stephen died and the way that our Lord died. What did Stephen do? He has false accusers against him. They are going, they stone him to death. But even then, he prays for them. Don't hold this sin against them. Just as our Lord has said, Father, forgive them. And just as our Lord said, into your hands, Father, I commend my spirit. So he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And so we want to die in that way too. We want to live like Stephen lived, like the saints lived. Pope Benedict gave a, he just concluded a catechesis on the lives of the saints, which he's been doing for the last two years. And in April, he brought this catechesis on the lives of saints to a conclusion. And in this, he said, holiness, the fullness of Christian life does not consist of realizing extraordinary enterprises, although we see that in the lives of saints, but in making our own his attitudes, the Lord's attitudes, his thoughts, his conduct, our own. We mold all of our life to his. And he says, how can we become holy? It's really not complicated. It's really not complicated. Essential is that no Sunday be left without an encounter with the risen Christ in the Eucharist. This is not a burden, but a light for the whole week. You see, if we're going to live this new life, that even in the midst of the tragedies of this life, that there's this resurrected life, this new life, alive in us and at work in us and in the world, then we have to have this encounter with the risen Lord. So those who neglect worshiping the Lord, gathering for the Eucharist on Sunday, are depriving themselves of one of the essentials for growing in this new life, this encounter with the risen Lord. Second, he said, never to begin or end a day without, le without at least a brief contact with God. So to begin your day, there should be some prayer at the beginning of your day and the end of the day. At least you have some encounter with the Lord in prayer each day. And thirdly, he said, in our journey of life, to follow road signs that God has communicated to us in the Ten Commandments read with Christ. 
which is simply the definition of charity in specific situations. So go to Mass on Sundays, have this living encounter with the risen Lord in the Eucharist. Second, have an encounter every day, at least, the beginning and the end of the day with prayer. And thirdly, follow these road signs of Ten Commandments, which is basically charity in specific situations, because the whole essence of holiness is living a life rich in charity, love of God and love of neighbor. But I especially wanted to emphasize something he says later on in this Wednesday audience. Perhaps we might ask ourselves, can we with our limitations, our weakness, reach so high? During the liturgical year, the church invites us to recall a lineup of saints who have lived charity fully, like our saint today, Saint Ignatius of Laconi, who was known for his humility and his charity, who have lived charity fully and have been able to love and follow Christ in their daily lives. The saints belong to all the ages and all states of life. They are the concrete faces of all peoples, languages, and nations, and they are very different among themselves. And I would like to add that for me, not only the great saints that I love and know well are road signs, but also the simple saints. That is, the good persons that I see in my life who will never be canonized. They are ordinary people, to say it somehow without a visible heroism, but in their everyday goodness, I see the truth of the faith. This goodness which they have mature, matured in the faith of the church, for me, is a sure defense of Christianity and a sign of where the truth is. When you see this goodness even in the ordinary folk who are living lives of charity like this, people who have this outreach to those and their difficulties, that we see the new life of Christ alive. And so he says that we also are pieces of the great mosaic of holiness that God is creating in history. That's a beautiful image, to think of all of human history as this mosaic. A mosaic is something that's made up of many little stones that make a picture, a portrait. And what is a portrait that is being made, this image? It's the face of Christ. And that you and I are stones in that great mosaic by living lives of holiness in the ordinary uh, part of our lives. But we're striving to be faithful. We have this living encounter with the Lord in the Eucharist, in prayer, and in observing his road signs, the commandments, which are concrete ways for us to live charity. This past week also, I had the opportunity to visit twice uh, Sarah Bernelli, who passed away last evening. And her children have had a, a lot, a big part to play in EWTN. Uh, her son, Sam, worked here for many years. Kathy and Judy have worked here for many years and are still here, and even her grandson Elmo was here for a number of years as well. And when I visited her, we were talking and she said, you know, I've, I'd always talk about the reality with, with my friends. I talk about the reality of death. They will die. And she said something, I don't remember exactly what it was, but it made me laugh. And she said, now you tell my daughters that I made you laugh. But the second time I visited her, she received the bad news that she had terminal cancer. But even in that moment, as I brought the Holy Eucharist to her, it was like there's the resurrected Lord is coming to meet her, to unite his, her sufferings with himself, to unite her to himself. And so there's hope even in the midst of the darkest times or the worst news that we can receive. I was telling her about this book that I had recently read, Heaven is for Real, about this little boy, Colton Aburpo, who was not yet four years old and 
was misdiagnosed with a ruptured appendix. And so this poison's going through his system for five days. Finally, his parents take him to another hospital where they immediately take him to surgery and didn't expect him to survive. And in fact, he died for a short time, but he recovered. But later he talked to his parents. He said, Mom and Dad, there are no old people in heaven. And nobody wears glasses in heaven. He said, I have, a sis I have a, a two sisters. And they said, no, you just have one sister, Casey. And he said, no, I have two sisters. I met her. And she told me that she died in your tummy, Mommy. And they had never told him that they had had a miscarriage before uh, Colton was conceived and born. So these things that he uh, could not know, he said mom, to mom and dad, his mom and dad, did you know that God is three, three persons? Well, yes, we did. But in telling those stories, I was just helping to bring about that understanding that our hope is not limited to this life and the tragedies and difficulties that we have in this life. We know that our hope springs eternal because of what God has prepared for us, this heavenly home that is our promise. And the Eucharist is that bread of life. Jesus said, he who eats this bread, he who comes to me will never hunger. He who believes in me will never thirst. I am the bread of life. And this is that food of immortality. This is the remedy for death that the Lord gives us and that we receive this day in the Holy Eucharist. So as we see around us many signs of the resurrection, let us every day encounter the risen Lord to receive him as often as we can in the Holy Eucharist so that we may be transformed, that we may be sanctified and be part of this great mosaic of holiness that we see in the lives of saints throughout history. One of the greatest proofs of the truth of our faith, the goodness that we see uh, in humanity and the hope of resurrection that is present. Finally, a saintly old woman once said, God takes a hand wherever he can find it. Sometimes he takes a priest's hand and lays it on a child's head in benediction. Then he takes the hands of a doctor to relieve pain, the hand of a mother to guide her child. And sometimes he takes the hand of an old woman like me to comfort a neighbor.